This podcast is brought to you by North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives. This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Thanks for tuning in this week's NC Spin. Once again, this week, the coronavirus uh, pandemic dominated just about all our lives. And we want to discuss how it's impacting our state. We're going to begin with part of an interview we did with DHHS Secretary Mandy Cohen. Then our panel is going to discuss impacts on health care, the economy, and education. Speaking of the panel, this week's panel includes John Hood, syndicated columnist and author, Peg O'Connell, political analyst and health care consultant, Phil Kirk, former chair of the State Board of Education and former cabinet secretary after a, a long vacation away from us, and Rob Schofield, director of NC Policy Watch. We'll begin our uninterrupted debate after these brief messages from our underwriters. Today's tools make you a real DIYer, and as a member of an electric cooperative, you have lots of valuable tools to help you do it yourself in controlling your home energy use and budget, leaving you free to be dad. The big issue in 2020 is health care. Let's talk basics. You are the key to your own personal health, but there is strong evidence that if you have a relationship with a family physician, your quality of life will be better. You'll likely live longer and you'll have 33% lower health care costs. Your family doctor knows you, has your medical history, and can quickly diagnose health problems. Family Physicians, your trusted health care advisor for life. Once again, DHHS Secretary Dr. Mandy Cohen took time to talk to with us uh, earlier this week about where we are on COVID-19. So we begin the show with excerpts from that interview. Secretary Cohen, thank you for meeting with us again. We've all been following what's going on in North Carolina as well as in other states like New York and Florida and Pennsylvania. Uh, they're seeing explosions in the number of COVID-19 cases. Is this what you have been sort of warning us about and telling us was coming to North Carolina? We saw this starting outside the United States. So we've been preparing uh, here in North Carolina since January. Um, and w I am so glad to work for a governor that has taken really aggressive steps to try to protect North Carolina. I know these decisions have been hard on many families, uh, and I was mine, in mine included, about schools being closed, restaurants being closed, only, uh, only can do takeout. Um, I know visitations limited at nursing homes. These are all hard decisions, but I hope it's ones that will allow us here in North Carolina to see a slower spread of the virus than some of those we other states. We don't have as many cases in North Carolina as they have in some other states. Is this because we were further coming into this virus situation because we've taken better precautions, or is there any explainable reason. Yeah, so I think there's a number of factors. So yes, we were later at seeing our first case, we were later at seeing our hundredth case, we were later at seeing our first community spread, all good things that help protect us over the longer term and hopefully see a slower spread of this virus. I think it's a number of reasons. I mean, look, we're not as densely populated as in New York City. We don't have the big international airports of some of those other um, places, but certainly we do. We have international travel and that's why you see us, but we also were a state that took early aggressive action. And I think all of these things together, I hope will, will be protective from North Carolina, but the data is still coming in on that and we're watching it very closely. Uh, President Trump has said he wants everything to return back to normal business as usual by Easter Sunday, April 12th. Given what you're seeing in North Carolina, is this at all possible? I don't see Easter Sunday being a, a time where we're going to be able to be back to normal. Um, I think that we're going to be dealing with this virus until we have a vaccine. Now, what levels of intervention do we need over different time periods? I think that's what we're still trying to learn from our data. And on Monday in your press conference, you said the protocols are now changing. That's right. And what you're saying is if somebody has mild symptoms, mm -hmm. Uh, fever, dry cough, and they're not in the at-risk categories, mm -hmm. stay home mm -hmm. for seven days, right. let it go away, mm -hmm. uh, see if the fever uh, mm -hmm. gets, it goes down, 
uh, before any possible testing is concerned. Mm -hmm. That's a switch in philosophy. That is. So at different phases of this response to the virus, we're going to need different tactics. Um, before, where we were ramping up and trying to really test a lot of folks, um, again, to get a really good sense of what was going on in North Carolina and the virus. Now we are getting recommendations from the CDC that says just that, is if you are, have a fever and a cough, stay home um, to make sure that you are not spreading the, the virus to everyone else um, and to make sure that you are not going to a place where you could potentially catch the virus. So if you're sick, stay home, call your doctor. Um, and what I, and I would also say is like, look, we're going to be at different phases of response um, to this virus and things will change. It's why it's really important to get good and accurate information um, from, from us because it's going to change over time. And Governor Cooper uh, banned gatherings of more than 50 people. That's right. And you said that social distancing was the strongest weapon that we have yeah. right now right. to deal with this. Uh, it is fairly obvious that a lot of people aren't following those instructions. So what happens if they don't abide by this yeah. executive order? Well, you can see we've been incrementally increasing our enforcement of those social distancing policies. We still implore folks, please, please, no big gatherings. Um, we, we know that our restaurants and bars are complying with takeout and, and delivery only. Um, we know, but uh, we're trying to encourage folks, telework, telework, it with where at all possible. Now, we know we're always going to have some emergency um, or first responder folks who are going to have to go to work. Um, and, and, essential, and do those. Essential exactly. And, and so, but for everyone else, we're really encouraging folks to, to be at home um, and respect these enforcements. And we'll go further if we need to. The Hospital Association mm -hmm. uh, earlier this week mm -hmm. called for uh, you and the governor and the team uh, to join 16 other states in mm -hmm. issuing shelter in place orders. Yep. Uh, what was their motivation behind this? Well, look, they're they're looking at, at some of the scary things that are happening just a few states away in New York, um, and I understand that. And so, and we know we don't have a vaccine, we don't have medicines for this. Um, we know we can surge our capacity, but there are limitations to all of that, to supplies, to ventilators, to, to, to people resources. Um, so we know on the front end, taking these aggressive steps to limit the gatherings and limit um, people interacting is the way that we can prevent that curve of people getting sick from getting too high. But the question is, where where is that right point and for how long? Well, that's I was what we're ask through. because Mecklenburg yeah. County, Durham yep. County, yep. Uh, Madison County, Pitt County, and Beaufort uh, have all issued stay home directives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for, is that the way this is going to play out? Do you think it's going to be a county by county thing or will it be a statewide decision? Yeah, so look, um, given where we are with things and the fact that we don't have as much data as we would want to guide these decisions, we support the local entities doing what they think they need to do to tailor to their local community circumstances. They're looking at their own case counts and how they're, they're, they're going up. It's not the same across every part of North Carolina. So I think tailoring to their, their local situations feels like a good first step. Long Any cover. final words that you want to mention yeah. Uh, to or say to the people of North Carolina? Well, I think I've said a lot about please, please follow the, the mandates that we've put in, but I'm asking to go further than that, right? Go further than the mandates. The mandates are supposed to be the minimum, and I'm hoping folks can do um, the, the social distancing um, beyond that, and particularly for those in high risk, over 65, with chronic diseases, immunocompromised, got to take care of yourself. Um, the other thing I would say is thank you to all of those um, who are staying home, who have changed their lives to protect those amongst us. We thank Secretary Cohen for her candor. She is so good at being able to elaborate what's going on in this fast changing story. And uh, by the way, you can see the unedited interview that we did by going to ncspin.com and looking at the featured video section on the, on the site. Phil Kirk, you were Secretary of DHHS under two different administrations. Uh, can you even imagine what it's like in that emergency operations center? We've been there the last Wednesday, the last three Wednesdays, and it's, it's wow. I'm thankful that we were fortunate not to have to use that center during my two times as secretary, but we had something similar, uh, much smaller basis, and that was in 1976 when we had many people in North Carolina and across the country dying of the, the, from the flu, flu shot and a doctor on my staff made the suggestion that I take the shot. 
uh, at a press conference to show that it was okay. So I said, fine, but I went into work that morning and dictated my will uh, to an administrative <laughs> assistant. So, but anyway, I took, Typical the, Phil Kirk. I took, I took the shot and, and uh, President Ford did the same thing that day. But anyway, I can imagine the, the center, and you've got to have several things successful for a successful center. One is a governor or a president who relies on the experts. I, not being a medical doctor like uh, Dr. Dr. Cohen, Cohen. Uh, I had to rely on Ron Levine and other people yeah. who were state health directors. Yeah, so far as it goes, Peg, uh, the secretary says we're not near the peak, uh, that it's maybe two or three weeks away. Um, we've had our first two deaths in North Carolina. Uh, how are people responding to this? Well, you know, Tom, I think people are starting to take this more seriously now. I think at first it seemed almost like a lark. Uh, almost we could have a, a party like Vacation. we do with yeah. hurricanes. Vacation. But um, yes, but now they're realizing people are dying and that they that we can't be gathering and drinking a beer together. I mean, we might be able to sit across a room and not talk, but I think I know in my family, Jack and I are taking this very seriously. Our friends are taking it seriously. My family in Ohio is taking it very seriously. John, there's evidence, however, that uh, people are getting weary from this and that uh, they're not staying home. They're not keeping their social distance from each other. Uh, I had to go out uh, yesterday uh, in Raleigh and uh, rode by a tennis court that was just absolutely slam-jammed full of people. Um, is that going to bring about further restrictions? The secretary hinted at it. It, it might. It certainly should in the case of, uh, and you've seen some local communities do additional restrictions on things like uh, recreational facilities and parks. You want people to have some way uh, to, to make it through the, the next several weeks uh, w without going plum crazy. But you, <laughs> you simply cannot have people grouping together. The, in California, they had to close a bunch of trails. You would think, well, at least like wilderness trails. Well, not if large groups gather like it's a tailgating opportunity. That's not responsible. And Rob, there are a lot of people at the that are... the beginning of this. Yeah, well, Rob, there are a lot of people saying, wait a minute, there are 38 counties in North Carolina that don't have a single instance of coronavirus yet. Secretary yeah. Cohen says, wait, it's coming. Yeah, uh, sadly, I mean, we know it's inevitable. It's going to spread throughout the population. Again, this whole idea of flattening the curve doesn't mean that we're going to stop it in its tracks. It just means we're going to spread it out. This thing's going to continue to be a problem, not just for weeks or months, probably for years, as we say, until we get a vaccine and some sort of, you know, uh, scientifically based treatment. So people need to really just hunker down. It's going to be a tough several months that we're going to have to go through. Well, North Carolina saw record numbers of unemployment claims within the past few things, uh, few days, well over 170,000 claims. They're used to accepting 3,000 claims in a week, 170,000 over a period of about 12 or 13 days. Our workers are suffering as some of our businesses are worried. We'll sink into a depression that it'll almost be impossible to recover from and that we need to jumpstart the economy, even if it might mean risking the safety of some people. Others are saying, wait a minute, uh, we should solve the health crisis first, then work on fixing the economy. Peg O'Connell, uh, when I asked Secretary Cohen about this question, whether it was the economy or, or, or safety, she said it didn't have to be an either or situation. Do you agree? Well, first of all, let's talk about what some people you want to put at risk. Um, the, this, we already have our first responders, our health care workers, grocery store people, uh, the essential service people, they're already at risk. Do you want to, I mean, and I know you well, didn't say Well, I think they're this, talking about Grandma throwing, and Granddad, yeah, actually. Yeah, throw a whole other group of people into that kind of dangerous mix right now. Um, I do agree with Secretary Cohen. It's not an either or proposition. I think it's a now and then proposition. The first thing we have to do is use our best scientific and medical judgment to get our hands, if you'll pardon the pun, around what's going on, get this, get through this. It will be temporary, but we have to go through it and then we can focus on improving the financial health of the state. If we don't deal with the, the physical health aspects of this, it won't matter what happens with the economy because of the devastation to the state. But John, a lot of people are saying, hey, wait a minute, the cure here may be worse than the disease itself. You wrote a column this week, which I thought was very interesting. You said North Carolina's already in a recession. 
We are. I mean, there's no question about it. And it's important for people not to misunderstand the purpose of something like the federal relief package that passed or is about to pass. Uh, that is not a stimulus. It isn't, actually. You can't stimulate an economy if people aren't producing goods and services. It's a way to tie people over. It's a way to keep them from go, you know, losing an asset where they have a debt on it or something like that. But the only way the economy gets going is for people to produce goods and services. Now, the, the interesting thing is these, these shutdown orders, these st sheltered places, they have lots of exceptions and lots of industry and lots of jobs will be preserved, but lots of others won't. I'm mean, just be brutally frank with everybody. Uh, we will not be in shelter in place for three months. It's impossible. People won't follow that order and the economy will collapse. We and so there will have to be some graduated, careful, they're going to have to use serological testing, they're going to have to try to figure out how, it's not going to be, turn the switch off, turn the switch on. Uh, people who suggest you could turn the whole switch on in a couple of weeks are foolish, but at the same time, it ha you have to gradually get uh, goods and services produced. That's what the economy the, the is. It's supply, not money. The supply chain has got to work, and, and there's evidence that it is still working even under the circumstances. Uh, Phil, the Fed's passed a $2 trillion relief package this past week through Congress. Uh, and there's talk about uh, maybe in North Carolina we need to be doing uh, some additional uh, supplemental kind of, of work for people. That, that, but, but to do that, we've got to get the, the legislature back into special session. Now, last week, I had a telephone call, with a long call, with Jerry Cohen who's probably forgotten more about legislative operations than most of us would ever learn. Or want to know. <laughs> Jerry says the Constitution's pretty clear on this. It says you must be present for there to be uh, a session. Uh, What's something like the Constitution, you know, when times like this, and I'm, being, I'm, joking, I'm <laughs> joking when I say that, but I, I think the legislature and the governor have been wise to uh, not jump into something t until they saw the details of the Fed so they could complement it rather than, than try to uh, outdo the Feds. And they're now committees meeting uh, or subcommittees or whatever meeting to, to come up with a package. So and I listen, think that's prudent. Let me just say this. For all the animus that there's been between the governor and some of the legislative leadership, they are working together very well right now to try to look at what's best for North Carolina. And that's an encouraging that's an encouraging uh, factor for us. Uh, so far as it goes, uh, uh, Rob, uh, in doing all of this, should we at some point in time uh, draw down this rainy day fund? We've got an unemployment insurance account, by the way, of what is it, $3 billion? Yeah. Uh, loosen up some of the almost unemployment insurance. Dollars. It's how much? It's almost $4 billion. $4 it's, billion. Dollars. It's going to go in a New York minute. Yeah. It, uh, the reality is that the surpluses we have are nice. But they, we haven't, because we have systematically disinvested in the core public structures and systems, they are not as resilient as they would be had we left taxes where they were in 2013 when we were already a friendly business state. Um, I fear very greatly that because we have taken this approach of, of slashing taxes, disinvesting in core services like unemployment, making it very hard to get, we've got real problems. And as for the legislature, I saw this week where the Arkansas General Assembly is meeting effectively in a, in a sports arena. And, you know, that might be an alternative for the General Assembly to find a place to meet where they can sit, you know, distances apart. Maybe that's a better solution than meeting at the legislative building. There are, there are some who might speculate that it's a sport to start off yeah, with. Well, exactly. <laughs> we can have uh, well, a the solution peanut gallery. I think they're discussing is uh, having, if they're going to have vote, and of course the purpose of having a session is to have votes, have votes to pass, yes. right. is to have very long times to cast the ballot so people can come in small groups into the building. I don't think that would violate the Constitution. That's there a has rules to be, question. There has to be a quorum present at some point yeah. in this, according uh -huh. to Jerry Cohen. And who's going to call for the quorum? Well, well but, but if you met in an alternative venue and they sat, just you could actually have debate, you could actually be present to listen to what everybody's saying, I think that might be a better solution than trying to traipse people in and so out. So we'd of have the, the Senate and the in the red uh, portion of the court and the... Maybe the this Raleigh Civic Center, I don't know, the PNC Arena, uh, whatever we call it now. I mean, well, they used that for a blood drive yesterday. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, maybe also, that's... Important. Also, if you have a truly bipartisan group working on the solutions, then there might not, like in Washington, there might not be as much need for debate. That's true. And it could be passed much more quickly uh, than if you're thinking of a traditional session. Well, it, the, the, whole, the whole economy aspect of this... Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid, is turning into a political debate, uh, Peg, and, and that's unfortunate because 
as John has said in his column and others have said, this ain't about politics. It's about trying to do what's best for people. Well, I think that's absolutely true. And I, and I do applaud the legislative leadership and the, the committee that was actually almost virtual uh, earlier this week that took testimony from the hospital association and from the medical society. They're getting their best advice on what to do next. And I think we'll see some more of that spin yeah, out. Yeah, then we got Gary Salamito in the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce, and they're saying, wait a minute, we can't just shut down the entire... I mean, this is a real... But you have one of, of Gary Salamito's uh, board members, Carl Armado, from, who's the head of Novant Health, who said, um, history will record what we do at this time, and that if we have to make a judgment, we should take steps to protect the lives and health, health of the community first. Speaking about politics, uh, we, we've got to bring up the fact about Richard Burr's stock sale uh, that took place. It's, it's being investigated. Uh, he's being sued. There are a lot of people calling for him to resign. John, uh, is this just a s sidebar issue that gets people revved up, or is there something real here? I think the investigation is necessary and will reveal that. If, if the senator has no realistic ac explanation about the use of public information to take the actions that he did, that's a problem. If he does have an explanation, then that's the answer. I mean, it's premature to exonerate him or to convict him. We, we ran a story on NC Policy Watch this week uh, where our Washington correspondent talked about the fact that the Senate Ethics Committee does not have a real robust history of doing very uh, powerful investigations of its own members. I don't think mem that the public should expect a whole lot of uh, information to come out of this investigation or any kind of real punishment to be uh, imposed on Burr as a result of the Senate Ethics Committee. You know, and this is unfortunate, but it's, it's some, in some weird karma way, uh, that $1.3 million that he uh, took out of the stock market will probably go to pay his lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. I'd, well, look, I'd just like to add that on a personal note, I've known Senator Burr for over 30 years, and prior to this instance, I have never uh, had any doubts about his oh, honesty. Yeah. But, Richard's uh, a straight-up guy, generally. But I think the ethics, I think, uh, the ethics uh, uh, committee looking into it is the next step. In a press conference on Monday, Governor Cooper stated what most had already anticipated. Schools would not open until at least May 15th. Since the biggest expenditure in state government is education, this topic is especially important in this COVID-19 climate. John, students were told they'd be given only, uh, only be given instruction. H has this developed? Is it available to most of the students? Any idea how well it's working? It, it is. I got three questions in there for <laughs> That's you. a lot of questions. The answer is it's a mess. It is a mess, and everybody involved with it's a mess. Parent but, but admits that it's a mess. Parents are, are increasingly upset about it. Now, I'm not sure anybody has a legitimate blame to go around, but that the state is not prepared to deliver this level of content. There was some, a lot of disputes about, can you deliver new content to students if they're not equally accessible? Uh, and that's a problem because lots of parents understand that, but other parents are like, you mean my students are basically out of business for the rest of the semester? Well, not only that, Rob, but they've essentially missed a third of the school year because yeah. uh, the last three months of the year, assuming they're getting some instruction, some. but not full. Are we going to have to make this year up for students? Well, we're going to have to do something. I mean, the bottom line is that we're not going to have a normal school year. We did a story on Policy Watch also this week about some folks in Durham who are still living in hotels because they were moved out of a broken public housing complex. Complex. They're trying to teach their kids, you know, off their phones in a hotel room. Well, a lot of these kids don't even have laptops. Right. That's right. Uh, and it, again, like so many things in education, it varies from county to county, from rich to poor. And But even in Wake County, uh, one of the wealthiest school districts, my grandchildren don't know what I'm talking about when I ask them what are they doing in regard to their schoolwork. They and then they tell you and you don't know what they're talking about either. That's why you're going to admit that. That's the way it is with me. It, it does vary and it also varies by age. Some of the older students in high school, they're getting some productive value just like college students are, but as you go down in grades, that, that d diminishes significantly. Peg, one yes. thing that Superintendent of Public Instruction Mark Johnson said this week on that uh, news conference I thought was significant. He said, it is highly important for young students 
to keep structure in their lives. Wake up at the same time of the day. Do whatever instruction you can do. And he, by the way, he, he mentioned Khan Academy as being a place where you could go online to get some instruction. But have instruction at the same time, meals at the same time, playtime at the same time, going to bed. This is an emotional assurance for these young kids who are watching what's going on. Would you agree? I would agree. I think kids need stability. I think adults need stability. That's why uh, the idea of getting out and getting some activity in your daily life, whether it's a child or an adult, you try to set up some kind of normalcy so that we can cope. So far as it goes, John, uh, uh, are they going to go back this summer? To finish up the school year? I think year? that will be seriously considered. There'll be a lot of pushback from a travel industry, a hospitality mm -hmm. industry that's already been smacked. But I don't see any alternative but to add some additional valuable educational time. Can I close this show on a personal note? My beloved mother, who is in a facility where I can't go visit her, is going to be celebrating her 98th birthday on Wednesday. And I want to wish her a happy birthday. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day. To stay informed all during the week, sign up for our free weekly email newsletter. Give your feedback and read our weekly column. Visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch us on Facebook. And be sure to tune in next week when we take on more issues of the day. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. Today's tools make you a real DIYer, and as a member of an electric cooperative, you have lots of valuable tools to help you do it yourself in controlling your home energy use and budget, leaving you free to be dad. The big issue in 2020 is healthcare. Let's talk basics. You are the key to your own personal health, but there is strong evidence that if you have a relationship with a family physician, your quality of life will be better you'll likely live longer, and you'll have 33% lower health care costs. Your family doctor knows you, has your medical history, and can quickly diagnose health problems. Family Physicians, your trusted health care advisor for life. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network.